Agriculture is the backbone of our country, Uganda. Doing value addition is another thing. My name is John Paul Seguya, and today at Amit the Founder Program, we are at Rena Beverages. We are going to see how to add value on hibiscus. Many of you have seen hibiscus, but you don't know which products you can get from hibiscus. So we hope today you'll be able to learn something from here. Thank you. I am part of Rena Beverages as a quality control person and also I am a nutritionist. So I, I contribute my knowledge on planning what products to make because our focus is to make products that provide nutrients to people. Uh, Rena Beverages is a family business, a home cottage industry as you can see. It uh, started in 2012 with Miss Regina Nakaenga who is the proprietor and uh, we have all started to contribute. For example, myself, a quality control person, and other individuals like you can see, who are working with us in the production unit, and also marketing. Um, so, I, in my opinion, it was not so much of big inspiration. It was slowly, gradually getting into business uh, because of the need that for the products. So the inspiration could be the need for quality, nutrition, nutritious products. So she started with passion fruit concentrate. Uh, we all know passion fruits are everywhere, but sometimes they're out of season and you'd want to have passion fruit all through the year. So during the high season, she would process it into a passion fruit concentrate and then customers would have it all year round. The same natural passion fruit not artificial. So it was very exciting for customers to have something natural. Then uh, we have the hibiscus plant, which is very nutritious. And for Miss Regina herself, she had a chance to use this hibiscus tea for her own health and it was benefiting her. So she started to then process this hibiscus into a powder, mm. which we call the hibiscus tea. And then we also make hibiscus juice from the same plant. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's more starting to utilize plants that are rich in nutrients mm. and then you get them out to the consumer. For example, you would want to take hibiscus tea but then you don't have the plant in your home. Sure. But we have the plants, the farmers, and then we package it for you so that you can have it on a daily. The vision is to be a leading producer of nutrition rich products uh, from natural plants. Okay. Not just nutrition rich but from natural plants. Our local plants processed into a product that is highly nutritious. Okay. Yes, we also add value to okra, the okra plant. There is a species that grows so much and then we get the seed out of it and make okra coffee. We also do from the peach palm, which is locally known as Mpibibuma, that is also a very highly nutritious plant, high in antioxidants, and we make a powder out of it, which we call the peach palm coffee. And we also do rosemary, most of us could already know rosemary. Yeah. Rosemary is a plant we use as a spice, mm -hmm. but it also has nutrition benefits. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we dry it and then process it into a powder. Okay. Mm. We are able to impact every farmer that sells to us their produce. We use hibiscus, so they, we are impacting those farmers. Because without us buying their hibiscus, they have grown this crop and they have no one to sell to. Mm -hmm. So we impact farmers, biggest group is farmers by being able to buy their farm, their produce and we're also being able to impact these farmers by guiding them on how to grow these plants better mm. um, because it's one thing to have the farm it's another thing to have the best yield mm. that is highly take a, uh, uh, highly preferred mm. by the consumer okay. so we are actually indirectly impacting the health of these individuals
Yes, uh, I'm Michelle, uh, I'm from Belgium and uh, I come here as a visitor for Rena Beverages. Uh, I study um, sustainable entrepreneurship and innovation and uh, this is actually a perfect example of uh, innovation that is entrepreneurial and also sustainable because they use local products from local farmers and um, the way they process it is also natural, it's organic and in this way um, these products would be very interesting for um, the European, European market. Uh, I learned about all these products. I never heard about, for example, Pirovina. I never learned about the okra coffee. Uh, I never learned about hibiscus tea. So all these products were new for me. And I must say they taste delicious. And um, yeah, it's also a nice feeling that you get a connection with the African land if you come here. I would tell them for sure visit Rena Beverages because um, it's a very welcoming company and um, they have taught me already so much in one week so um, for sure thank you bye bye So Regina someone out there watching you would like to know how are you able to start up this project because today many young people in Uganda especially, they, like, they have lots of ideas, but they thought to implement that idea. So how did you, how did you start up this company? So uh, Miss Regina, my mother, started this company um, by starting with a passion juice processing. But first we got a training from the local church, um, the Catholic church held a women's training in juice processing mm -hmm. and wine making. So with that knowledge, so there was, there was a training at the Catholic Church women's group in juice and wine processing and got lessons on making organic juices and then she came home and tried it. At that time she was still a lecturer at Chambogo University so she would make this passion fruit concentrate juice and go with it and sell it to her fellow lecturers and of course friends were her first customers. So pretty much the first cost it was about 50,000 Ugandan shillings um, with, for buying the passion fruits and you use your normal saucepan you have and then you process this industrial juice. And of course when people start to know, started to learn about what she's doing, then there was a need to increase the volumes that she was making, then you start buying more and more equipment. But first, the first production was really to get the first customers just about five, six liters. And right now we are able to make over 400 liters of juice uh, because we have purchased uh, a boiler that is bigger than what we started with. And this juice is now made from hibiscus, uh, mainly because of the nutritional benefits. And then we also have the passion fruit once in a while and the pineapple juices. And then we also make other products. So you diversify beyond what you started with because people start to identify the business with natural products and you also look out for what you can add to that category of natural and nutritious products. So over the years, we have added the hibiscus tea, the okra coffee, the rosemary powder, etc. So with the addition of new products, and the bigger volumes you're able to sell to more people and get more revenue uh, every year, meaning the business gets more profitable over the years. Yeah. Wow, that's good. So, um, uh, what are it? some of the issues you've shared with us uh, how you've been able to grow? Mm -hmm. But uh, some I would like to know which other achievements have you been able to achieve? Uh, for us, being able to have quality certified products uh, by the Ghana National Bureau of Standards, UNBS, is also an achievement because it's not so many small scale businesses that are able to have certified products. So we were able to have our first certification in 2016. So we were able to have our first certification in 2016 where we certified the hibiscus juice and the hibiscus tea. 
and it was a journey. We even got to get an award for small scale business that is conforming to quality standard in agro-processing category. So that's an achievement on our side. Uh, one of our team members is also able to train other small scale businesses um, in helping them conform to the quality standards. So we take pride in that and in being telling the small businesses out there, especially in the food sector, that you still also can get the quality certification even as a small business. Um, the other really is really about the fact that we started with a low startup capital and we are able to sustain this business over eight, over nearly 10 years. Uh, for me, that's also an achievement. Yes. Yeah. That's good. So, um, uh, as entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. as entrepreneurs here in Uganda, mm -hmm. we face a couple of challenges. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure your mom or even you mm -hmm. as a company mm -hmm. have been able to surface these challenges. What mm -hmm. would be those challenges you've been able to surface? So, uh, the challenges with, first of all, I remember in 2014-15, we had started to really sell a lot of the juice the, the juice from the hibiscus and we have the one which is no sugar and we have the one that is really sweetened with sugar the normal sugar like you also buy from the shops um, and the price of sugar really went up and it's one of the big inputs in this pro in this product so it affected the cost of production but then the customer does not want to change the price of the juice they're buying so we try to change the price of the juice and we lost some business because then the person distributing, the wholesalers are a big way to sell juices in Uganda because they, they buy in bulk, then supply the small fridges around everywhere. Because every time you want a drink, you reach out to any fridge near you and you buy a drink, retail shops. So if the wholesaler is not happy with your price and the margin they can get from your product, they drop it. For them, they are, they are about their profits. They go, oh, health benefits, no. What profit margin am I getting from your product? So if your cost of production is really high, you can't really break through to these distributors and wholesalers because they won't take interest in your product. And without the distributors and wholesalers, you can't get to the retail shops. True. If you can't get to the retail shops, you don't get to your customer. True. Yeah. True. So that's a big challenge, the, diff, the varying costs of production. Okay. Then, of course, uh, the hibiscus plant, which is our biggest raw material, Sometimes the prices go up, but we have been able to try and mitigate that by increasing the connection with our farmers, by giving them uh, agronomy, um, uh, farming, farming and post harvest handling skills. So if I come to you and you're a farmer that supplies me and I'm helping you with the harvesting, we are also trying to come up with a harvesting tool for the hibiscus plant. We have a prototype already and we are looking to scale it up. So we wish that each farmer could get this tool to improve the harvesting. So with this uh, connection and support to the farmers, we believe that we can always get a good price from them and a sustainable supply of this hibiscus plant. Yeah, And of course, we will then stretch it out to all the other raw materials like okra, pilivoma, rosemary, among others. So those are some of the challenges. And then the other challenge is, of course, <laughs> the newest for Ugandans to take really attention to is the taxation. Um, when the Uganda Revenue Authority prepares its different taxes, of course, they, they, I'm sure they want to get the best for the country. But then we feel and we believe, along with so many other small-scale businesses, that if these small-scale businesses are the ones employing mm. the people at the grassroots and then you have a big tax on them, it means that it's easy for me to run out of business and then reduce the number of people who are employed. So I feel they should not only bring out a tax and think about the fact that, yes, you collect, but see what the impacts of these taxes are. When you bring a new tax, for example, there's a, a, a tax on local wines and alcohol. Um, how many people are able to stay in that business? Of course, you would be illegal if you're not paying this tax. So how many people are staying in this business? What's the impact of that tax? 
is, is, is the collection you predicted bigger than the people who are running away from that business? So I think that it's a big challenge for so many businesses. And of course, we have to be resilient and stay in business. But if the nation paid more attention, maybe we would stay in business happier and break even sooner than, than we expect, than waiting to break even for over 10 years, you're waiting for your business to be successful. Mm. Yeah, taxes really, it, uh, we are not against taxes, but what percentage of taxes? And of course, um, we like the fact that now there is some import substitution on machinery, but then it should be easy to access the substitutions because like you've seen, our processing unit is still manual. Um, but if I'm going to bring in some machine to package a certain thing and then the tax is over 40%, maybe uh, when you add up all the taxes, 18%, but when you add all of them up together. So meaning that's going to close to double, close to double the price of the machine I'm bringing in. Then I will stay manual for more years because even when I can afford the machine, I have to first budget for the tax as well. Maybe, and yes, there is this big announcement of how you can have the imp exemption mm. on the taxes, but is it easy to access this exemption for a small scale business? Is it really easy? Yeah, so that's, those are some of the challenges. Mm. Wow. Actually, mm. many entrepreneurs out there have faced couple of those, of yeah. th th those yeah. some of those challenges. And uh, based on what you've been discussed, okay, you've given us some of the solution you've been able to, mm. to, to solve. Like for example, like I discussed, the, the, you know, people were suffering with the, I, I discussed, mm. but you've been able to find a solution. But now, the taxes, have you been able to try, have you tried you guys to maybe talk to those people who are in charge of taxes to see how they can really help you guys? Mm. Um, I'm not in the finance department of the company, but I, I have seen that there are efforts to understand the taxes better and how best as a company to make sure we are compliant while still not breaking ourselves. Um, I'm sure any person with a small scale business out there will have had an encounter that is similar to this uh, URA officials believing that the director is earning so much. <laughs> but every small scale business owner knows that usually you're not paying yourself mm -hmm. as the director. As a matter of fact, if you have any other source of income, you're putting it into that business. But then there is this pseudo thought by the revenue authorities that mm -hmm. you're earning. And they question when you say you're not, mm -hmm. yet you may not be earning. So I think it's important that businesses understand these authorities may have a perception of what the business is. and people in our finance department have been able to understand that dialogue is important with the authorities to understand what your actual income is, what your actual salaries are for the people so that they do not overtax you. And then the other lesson and solution is not just saying, okay, there is so much taxes, so you just decide not to be compliant. It's easier to just go ahead and file so that they know indeed that you're not able to pay a certain tax, say income tax, this is the percentage you got. So be open, show them, and so that they are aware, not just running away. So the others, you have to approach them before them approach them. Yes, yes. Mm. Okay. That's, That's a small insight. I'm sure <laughs> Miss Regina would answer that better, and I think she has also been part of a few groups of people lobbying for fairness in this, um, because she is part of Uganda Women Entrepreneur Association and uh, once in a while they have been talking about the same issues. So Regina, someone out there mm -hmm. watching, you might be mm -hmm. a young person who would like to learn this, oh, maybe a partner who would like to partner with you. Mm -hmm. What do you look at for someone to join the team? So uh, the kind of partnerships we are looking forward to are partnerships first. Uh, to help us get more organic produce from our farmers because the farmers will need support. Uh, so if someone can come on board to help us understand how to be get the best yield from the hibiscus, okra and impidivuma plant while still protecting the environment. Mm -hmm. 
um, that would be amazing. And also to come up with farming technologies to harvest it faster. Because right now it's still manual. You have to open the flower, open it's It's very hectic. You would come out with red fingers that are even injured. So it would be amazing to have someone help us with those farming technologies. Um, because these are nutritious plants. If we produce more of them, there is an impact we are making. Then the second partnerships we are looking forward to is partnerships to help other women, especially women, and even youth, to start up their own businesses. As Rena, we have had experiences nearly 10 years, 2012 to 2021, learning about agro-processing, adding value to fruits, adding value to rosemary, natural plants. And we have knowledge that we can share with other startups. So if there's someone out there with a training institute, then we can offer this knowledge. Okay. Because what better trainer than a person who has experienced sure. this for over that's they say eight that, years? That's why they say that uh, experience mm. is the best teacher. Yes. So, because all the challenges we have been through, they will, we can predict for them and show them what to do. So we look forward, and of course, like I said, it should be area specific, because you should be able to add value to what you have, the raw material you have cheaply. Not just, oh, so and so is adding value to hibiscus, you're from a place where there is no plant at all, so you also try the same. Yet you could be having a particular plant in that area, that has a lot of wastage during the high season. Mm. We have all seen Matoke in some of our villages mm. during the high season mm. getting wasted. Mm. And we have knowledge as a small scale business on utilizing those plants. And I have knowledge as a nutritionist uh, on how to add value to these foods, to make them foods that are really nutritious for people. Mm. So, and and uh, one of us also has knowledge on, on adult training. Mm -hmm. So if we combine this with a partner who has the, the people to train, then it would be amazing. Wow, wow that's mm -hmm. good. So um, uh, as we are coming to the end of our um, uh, interview, mm -hmm. um, uh, what message would you give to the young entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. even the young people who are fearing to start up? Mm -hmm. There should be no fear in starting up as a young person, even a 60 year old, it's okay, you can start a business at that age. Um, there should be no fear. The only fear you should have is if the idea you're thinking about makes you happy, but doesn't make any other person happy. Because if you're not solving a problem for other people, then your business is not viable. Then you should scare, be scared to start, because what's a business without customers? And the customers will only come if you're impacting their lives. Mm. Wow, mm. that's so nice. So the person watching us out there, I think you've been able to learn something from uh, our fellow youth, Regina. There is a saying which says, one word to a wise is enough. I won't repeat what she has, been, what she has, say, what she has said, but uh, you could also start from where you are with what you have be the one with such an awesome drink and we'll be able to look for you to also share your story like what Regina has done to us. Thank you. You could also follow our social media for more of this inspiring video from different entrepreneurs. Bye for now. Hope to see you soon.